The next example is about stock market investments. So here we see a couple of examples. The stock prices for Amazon, Apple, Google and a couple more of the last years. And uh, they have all been normalized to start at 1 because we are not interested in the absolute prices but in the change of price. And we see that over this time period of 4-5 years the price for the Amazon stock has more than quadrupled and uh, the prices for a couple other ones have grown a little bit or have even diminished. And uh, less so in Europe, but uh, in America it's very common to invest your money into, into stock and also to, to do this for, for retirement. And uh, many Americans entirely rely on the stock market in order to not um, be homeless in, in the old age. Uh, but also for us here in Europe it's interesting because the stock market is a good way to uh, still earn money by investing. Uh, so in some years prior you could get maybe 4% um, at the bank but today it's more 0.5% and many people are asking where to invest their money and uh, well stock usually is considered high risk high reward. And today, what we will learn today is how to make stock investments high reward with only medium risk. So uh, the stock price, if you look at it, it looks kind of random. And uh, this is also acknowledged by looking at the histogram of the daily changes over time. So here we see the stock price changes of, of Google. And uh, this looks like a probability distribution or like a histogram with samples from a probability distribution. It even looks kind of Gaussian, but it's obviously schooled, so it's not a perfect Gaussian distribution. And uh, so the mean is here somewhere around 1.0. And uh, probably because the Google stock has increased in price over this time period, the actual mean will be somewhere here uh, larger than 1.0. That means on average every day, the stock is earning, is earning money, is, is increasing price, but obviously some, uh, sometimes uh, the stock is also losing. And um, the past is not a perfect predictor for the future. And um, therefore um, this uh, distribution probably will look slightly different in the next years, and especially if there is a next financial crisis or something. But otherwise this distribution is a kind of good predictor of what the Google stock uh, will, will uh, how, how it will change over the next years. There is, however, something called the efficient market hypothesis, and that says that uh, the traders have already integrated all the available information on the company in the stock price. And by considering the efficient market hypothesis, um, you cannot earn money by buying stock because all the uh, all the, all the information is already integrated in the price. However, this is generally not true uh, because not everybody has access to the same information and not access to the same analysis capabilities for choosing the best investments. And also it doesn't include things like quantitative easing where the government or the, the, the central banks are pushing big amounts of money into the stock market in order to avoid uh, financial collapse. So um, you still can earn money in, at the stock, but it all depends on the information that you have available and on the analysis capabilities that you have. The question we are interested here is how can we select an optimal portfolio? So if you're investing into stock, which stock should you buy? And how can we formulate this as an optimization problem? And this application example is exactly concerned with that. We will understand how the optimization problem is formulated and uh, how uh, you can do this at home and we will do this in the exercises also with the actual stock data. Uh, if maybe you have some investments to make in the next weeks, uh, you could actually use the investment strategies to good effect that you're learning here. Now, first of all, what we have to understand is that we are not totally rational with respect to the expected reward. But instead of the expected value of the stock, what we should also consider is what is called the utility function. And the utility is the subjective perceived 
value. So there is the, the, the numerical value, so how much money do we have in the bank account, but there's also the utility function, which basically describes how much your lifestyle and your living conditions improve by increasing your money by a certain uh, amount. And um, this will lead us to the consideration of risk. So if we were only expected in, only interested in the expected increase, then we could put risk entirely aside. But since risk obviously is important to us, we no longer consider just the expected value of the stock, but um, we have to integrate this with our personal utility function. And uh, the, the idea of the utility function, it dates back to, to Daniel Bernoulli, who gives a very nice example of a poor guy who somehow obtains a lottery ticket that has a 50% chance for winning 20,000 Ducats, so really a fortune back at the time, and it has a 50% a 50 chance of winning nothing. And uh, the question is, how much is this lottery ticket worth to the poor guy? So imagine he has not enough money to feed his family, he maybe lives on the streets, he is not warm, poor guy in the 1800s. And um, the question is whether the lottery ticket will be worth its expected value, which is 10,000 ducats, or whether the poor guy shouldn't rather sell his lottery ticket for 9,000 ducat that he gets with 100% certainty. So on the one hand, the expected value, 50% for 20,000 ducats would be 10,000 ducats. But the question is, if somebody were to offer 9,000 ducats cash in hand to the poor guy, shouldn't he take the money? And uh, Bernoulli, he argues that he should take the money because he should not consider the expected value of the lottery ticket, but he should consider what this brings him in improvement of lifestyle. And the difference between a poor guy who cannot feed his family and somebody who has 9,000 ducats where he can maybe already own nice houses, so multiple houses, the difference in lifestyle between 0 and 9,000 ducats is a lot bigger than the difference in lifestyle between 9,000 ducats and 10,000 ducats or 9,000 ducats and 20,000 ducats. Meaning um, the, the, the added utility of money decreases the richer you get. And today this is researched um, under the term prospect theory. So there were very famous publications by Kahneman and Tversky, you always mention the two together, um, who um, showed what the utility function is of actual people. So Kahneman and Tversky were interested in, in human behavior and were devising experiments to find out which mechanisms are happening in our brain when we make decisions. And uh, we are not totally rational and objective, but we rather follow also internal utility functions that we have and that can be explained. And uh, what they came up with or what they rather discovered, they didn't invent it, they discovered this, is a very um, characteristic S-curve. And uh, the S-curve is convex for winnings, meaning if we are playing poker and you are winning 5 euro, then you achieve a certain kind of additional well-being and you're happy that you won. Um, however, if you win 50 euro when we are winning poker, you are probably more happy than just by winning 5 euro, but not 10 times more happy. And this positive side of uh, the utility function, it describes how much your perceived value changes by adding more and more money to, to the winnings. On the other hand, if you are losing money, the curve is convex and it looks a little bit different because, first of all, losses are evaluated stronger than winnings. So this is a psychological effect. And uh, also, if we are accumulating and adding more and more losses, uh, you will evaluate the, uh, 
how, how much this loss impacts you um, by a convex curve that is somehow flattening out. And again here, um, somehow it, at some point it will really flatten out because imagine that you owe 10,000 euro to the bank, you're feeling bad about that. If you are owing 1 billion to the bank, you're feeling really bad about that and uh, probably you will have to get into um, uh, a special, special program for, for uh, getting rid of that debt within five years or so, um, which is the personal bankruptcy. So you're really feeling bad about that. But now if you're owing two billion to the bank, you will go into personal bankruptcy anyway. So somehow also on the loss side, at some point this curve, it will flatten out. Okay, now to the stock market and modern portfolio theory. So we still call this the modern portfolio theory today, but this dates from the 1950s. So it's already 70 years old. Uh, still, this is, this is modern portfolio theory about the stock market. And it was invented by Harry Markowitz, who back then was 25 years old, so maybe as old as you are today. And uh, he had the idea of modeling the stock price changes as a joint probability distribution over all the stocks. So this people have already investigated before him. But on top of that, to represent investment decisions as an optimization problem that make an explicit trade-off between the risk and the return of the investment. And uh, he came to the idea because he was in the middle of the development of modern optimization theory. So he worked alongside George Danzig and uh, well we already heard about Danzig, the inventor of linear programming. And uh, well he, he worked with Danzig uh, on optimization theory and tools and uh, alongside that developed modern portfolio theory. And there's a link between um, MPT, modern portfolio theory, and prospect theory, because from prospect theory we know that we, we attach a negative value to risk. We are risk averse in general. And uh, the question is, how should that risk be considered in our, in our investment decisions? Already in the 60s, some of the assumptions that were made by Markowitz were known to be not true. For example, assumptions on Gaussian distributions and so on. So today there is a much richer and also mathematically more advanced theory for doing investment decisions. But as a baseline, this is still working really nice even today. Now, we have to learn a couple of more uh, definitions from probability theory. Fear not, this will not be relevant for the exam, uh, but it will be very relevant for your understanding of this example if you want to later, for example, earn money on the stock market. So you will not become a professional um, investor just by having applied the methods of this example, but it will give you a really good baseline understanding and that will probably be even a better baseline understanding than you, you will, what you will get from your uh, advisor at the local Sparkasse or some other regional bank. Now, random variables, again, we are denoting them with an underline notation and every random variable lets us draw samples from an underlying probability distribution. So this is here we consider continuous probability distributions like Gaussian distributions and we want uh, so the, the probabilities for certain outcomes to be positive and the integral to be one and so only the very basic definitions for probability theory we will not go into measure theory here. And to this probability distribution we can attach um, the mean, so uh, the expected outcome. And uh, here the mean is just the notation for that is uh, mu r for the random variable r. In addition to the mean we have the variance, so how much the probability it, it, it fluctuates around the mean and uh, this is the expected value for the uh, sample that we take from r minus the average or the mean of r and the whole thing squared. In addition to the variance uh, or 
as something equivalent to the variance, we can look at the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance. So the variance here is sigma squared of a, and the standard deviation is just sigma of a. Um, so we just take the square root. The big advantage of the standard deviation is that it has the same physical unit as the underlying random variable. So if we are measuring, for example, the temperature in, in, in degrees Celsius, and uh, there is some random process from which we measure the, the degree Celsius, then the standard deviation of this measurement will also have the physical unit of degree Celsius. So this is the big advantage of the standard deviation. It is much better for, for interpretation of the meaning of that. However, the variance is better for computation. It has some nice properties that we will see in a little bit. In addition to the variance, there's also the covariance. So how much two random variables are moving together? Or what is their inclination? Or how are they positively related? Uh, and covariance and correlation are also um, similar terms. Correlation, again, we will see in a little bit. Now, the covariance we will describe as sigma squared AB. And uh, the formula for that is the expected value of um, the sample of A minus uh, the average of R times the sample of B uh, or the random variable B minus the average of B. And um, what you see here is, first of all, that the variance is just the covariance of a variable, of a random variable with itself. And the covariance is also symmetric. So covariance of AB is the same as covariance of BA. Okay, now Gaussian distributions that we already saw in one of the first lectures, they are special because they are defined only by their mean and covariance. So every random variable and every joint distribution over multiple random variables has a mean and covariance defined. However, Gaussians are special because we can describe the entire distribution only by the mean and the covariance. Now some more notation. Let's say we have two random variables. We can combine that into a vector of random variables. So here, fat, um, fat y with an underline. And if they are Gaussian, then the the uh, description or the, the definition of the Gaussian distribution uh, has two components. First, we, here we have the, uh, the vector of the random values and we have the matrix sigma, which is the covariance matrix and it contains all the covariances. So here, covariance of A with itself, which is just the variance of A, then the covariance of B with itself, so just the variance of B, and then the covariance AB and the covariance BA, and the two yellow ones here, they are equivalent. So this is also a symmetric matrix, and it will also be symmetric if you go to higher numbers of, of uh, multivariate distributions with many uh, random variables in a joint distribution. And now we can uh, see how the Gaussian is defined. So basically here the important term is this part and then uh, the, the first part here, this is just a normalization factor. So um, the, uh, the, the number in, in the fraction here, this is just a scalar number that uh, we need to use in order to ensure that the integral over the distribution will uh, be exactly one. And here, the n here depends on the dimensionality of the distribution, and then we have the determinant of the covariance matrix also somewhere in the middle of that. Okay, so those were some basic definitions for how random variables and probability distributions can be described. Um, many of these definitions apply to all probability distributions, and sometimes we then also make the additional assumption that a distribution is Gaussian. And these will now be applied to the stock values or to the, to the, to the historical data from the stock markets that we have. Now, how do we do that? First of all, for every stock, we want to estimate 
the average reward that we get from investing in that stock. Meaning every day we have a probability distribution for how the stock changes and we want to know how much in expectation the stock will change every day. And we can take that by just considering that every day is a sample drawn independently from some distribution. This is not true because the stock market it, uh, is a time series and obviously in the time domain all the, the days are, are coupled. So actually we are not drawing from, uh, we are not making independent draws from an underlying distribution, but this is also one of the assumptions that is made here. Uh, meaning that we take samples from so-called or we take so-called IID samples and the IID it stands for um, identically or independently distributed um, and uh, what we do is we just take then K samples which would be like the, the, the change every day for, for 10 years or a five year period and then we just compute the average by summing up the samples and dividing them by k, so the number of samples. And this is an estimator then for the true average mu. And uh, sometimes, so here we will call it um, overline y, if y is the underlying random variable. And uh, in other contexts it's also called mu hat, where the hat stands for an estimator for a certain value, and in this case we want to estimate the mu. Besides estimating the, the mean, we are also interested in the risk. So now considering all the variables, all the stocks independently, uh, we can also compute the, the variance for the daily change of the stock price. And uh, we do that by first computing the empirical mean, here the overline y, and uh, then taking the squared distance to that and, and summing that up. However, now we no longer divide the resulting value by k, but we divide it by k minus 1. And there are good reasons for that. So we will deal with large k, so maybe stock values from, from hundreds and thousands of days, where this minus 1 becomes less and less important. But still, we want to be correct here, because well, we are investing our money. Okay, now compare this um, this second equation here to the original definition of the variance and um, well the question is where does this k minus one come from and let me just get into that for a minute um, again this is not relevant for the for the exam but it should be really enlightening if you are interested in, in in stock investments and about probability in general so we just take here the sum of the squared distance to the empirical mean and develop that a little bit further. So first of all, what we do is we include first minus mu and then a plus mu in the equation. So minus minus is plus. Uh, so these two here in principle, they would be canceling out, but we are not canceling out. We are expanding here the, the square. And then uh, we get uh, to the next term um, with three different components. And uh, then we can simplify this and um, in the next step we can then remove here the two by removing this term. And uh, we then end up with the sum of i equals 1 over k, so the sum of all the samples we have of the sample minus the true mean. So here we have the true mean, minus k times, and here we have the empirical, the empirical uh, mean minus the true mean. And uh, now we plug this result into an expectation. So now we want to know what is this guy here in expectation, and therefore also what is this guy here in expectation and uh, now we can simplify a little bit more and uh, what is important here is that what we have here this is actually the variance of the mean estimator so 
our um, here we have our overline y and this overline y is the estimator for the true average but the overline y is itself also um, a random variable as long as we do not know our samples so whether whether something is random or not it doesn't depend on the nature of the world it depends on you uh, because um, if you have if you have perfect information about a system sometimes you can compute what the what the sample will be ahead of time and it will not be random to you but for another observer who doesn't have the same information about a system the sample could look completely random so randomness says more about you as an observer than about the system itself and as long as we don't have seen the samples as long as we didn't open the box with the samples inside as long um, also this estimator for the average will itself be a random variable and have also a variance and this here this is the variance of um, the rent of the estimator y overline and uh, we will see this in in i think two minutes but uh, we know that the uh, that this is the formula for the estimator and that the variance will reduce linearly in the amount of samples that we have taken and then we can simplify a little bit more and we come up with k minus one sigma squared we can uh, move the k minus one to the other side of the equation and then we exactly end up with the formula for the unbiased estimate of the variance so we have the sum of the squared distance to the empirical mean divided by k minus one okay so that was maybe a little bit far reaching into the into the definitions from probability theory but now finally let's apply everything to the stock market so we randomly select 100 and stocks 100 stocks from the S&P 500 index so this is a, just a list of the 500 most important stocks in, in America and uh, we will make this data also available to you for, for the exercises so we randomly select 100 of these stocks over some time period and uh, now we have every day the, for every day in the time series we have the, the, the opening and the closing price of the stocks and uh, now we can compute the mean and the variance so all the 100 stocks are depicted here in a figure and uh, the figure contains on the x-axis the annualized standard deviation so we take the standard deviation for every single day and we extrapolate that to the entire year so it's a little bit easier to think about what that would mean in, in, in daily change because the numbers are a little better to work with if you think about it in, in the annualized setting and also annualized here we have the expected value which means uh, in expectance if we look at the probability distribution how much will the stock price increase um, over time so here we have one particular stock that on average every year will increase by 60 percent that's quite a lot so you we can talk about whether it is likely that he will continue growing 60 percent every year or whether way or whether maybe some smart investor has already predicted that and has already integrated this into its current price but well that's the discussion of the efficient market now and we see that here we have a lot of combinations of risk and return so this guy here that is expected to grow 60 percent if the past is the predictor for the future um, he also has a quite large standard deviation of 0.3 there are other stocks that only have a standard deviation of uh, 0.12 so uh, here we have a variance of maybe three times uh, between the minimum and the maximum variance here of, of the stocks. And somehow we have to choose, somehow we have to balance that and we have to say, um, do, do we care about risk or not? And by how much do we favor uh, less risky stocks? And, um, but there is always a baseline 
So if you have too much money under your mattress and it's uh, hurting your back and you want to get want to get want to move it somewhere safe, uh, what you can do is, for example, you buy government bonds. So in the U.S., this would be called the T-bills. The T-bills are issued by the American government, who needs money and who's also in debt. But still, uh, these are considered zero risk because investors uh, assume that that uh, American government will not default, will not uh, go bankrupt. And uh, these uh, government bonds, they well, they have zero risk. So here, no zero standard deviation, uh, but they also give little return. So here it is assumed that their return is at 1.02. Um, today it's probably less uh, in today's market conditions, uh, but uh, in, in some 10 years prior or so, 2% uh, on government bonds uh, was possible, especially if you buy government bonds that uh, have a runtime of, of maybe 30 years or so. Um, then generally the, the, the percentages you get is, is increasing a little bit. Okay, now the question is, which stocks should you buy? And we have a preference for stocks that are here in the upper left corner, because these are the stocks that have a high reward, high expected reward and low risk. And somehow we want to make an investment and we want to combine these stocks in a way that we get high reward and little risk. And how can we do that? That's, that's the big question. For that, we have to consider also um, the combination of probability distributions. So far, we have only looked at each stock independently, and now we want to build a portfolio. So a portfolio with a combination of stocks. And the question is, how does the the, uh, the mean and the variance change when we are combining stocks. So adding them and maybe weighting them or scaling them and so on. And let's start first of all with independent probability distributions. So we are drawing samples from two lotteries that are not related or uh, somehow we have probability distributions that are independently from another in the probabilistic sense. And here, addition is rather straightforward because for addition, we can just add together the mean and we can add together the variances. And this is the nice property of the variance compared to uh, the, the standard deviation that we can just add up the variances when we have independent probability distributions. And for the, for the mean, this is straightforward. You can just look it up from the definition. Um, but for the variance, it's a, it's a two-line proof. Let's show this here. First of all, um, independent variables, they have zero covariance. And this is here the, 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 the first term in red. So the covariance between A and B is zero. It must be zero if we have um, independency between the two. And now we can just write down the equation for the variance of um, A plus B. And uh, again, we, we, um, we unpack this and unpack the square and we get to the, the equation here in the second line. Uh, here the middle term that is again in red. This is zero and it has to be zero because we are still in expectation here. And um, so we know this is zero from, from the independence. And uh, we can simplify and we just get to the variance of A plus the variance of B. For scaling, uh, it is a little bit different. So in scaling, for when we are multiplying our uh, random variable A by some scalar factor, uh, it is not linear. But if we are scaling from uh, R to alpha R, uh, we get linear scaling in the, in the mean, but the variance changes differently. So for the variance of alpha R, we have alpha squared times the variance of A. And the proof is, is a one-line proof. So again, here, this is the definition of the variance of uh, alpha R. And we can pull out the alpha in front, uh, pull it out of the expected um, term, and then we get alpha squared, the variance.
Okay, so these were just a, a three-line proof and an essentially a one-line proof, so all straightforward enough. But what's, what does that mean for us? The question is, if we have independent probability distributions, and if we now assume that the stocks were independent probability distributions, how should we diversify? How should we invest our money? And um, this is closely linked to the question of um, how the variance of an estimator improves when we have more and more samples coming in. But let me explain this. So let's say we have again a random distribution A and we are able to draw independent samples from them. So again IID, uh, independent and identically distributed samples uh, from, from the same distribution. And uh, we can this, and then we take the sum of this. So we take our k samples and we sum up over all of them. And uh, this can again be described by a random variable s, um, which is k times a. And uh, this then has variance um, sigma squared s uh, is k times or uh, sigma squared a. So variance of s is k times the variance of a. What is important here is the difference between this guy up here, uh, down here, and this guy up here. So on the left hand side we were scaling. What we could do is we just uh, scale our random variable by k, but then our variance would have increased by k squared times the variance of a. We are not doing that. What we do is we take k independent samples and um, let's say we were taking just two samples, then the equation from up here would apply. So then we would have the variance of a plus a, which would be two times the variance of a. But we don't have two samples, we have k samples, so in essence we, the variance increases by having k times the variance of a. Okay. Now we are um, not interested in the sum, but when we have an estimator, for example an estimator for the mean of the random distribution a, then we take our k samples and we divide everything by k. So this is what we did two slides before when we wanted to estimate the mean. We take k samples, sum it up, divide by k. But now when we are dividing by k, this is now a scaling. So this is now this scaling here. Here, it's like the scaling on this side. So, and therefore, here we uh, have to reduce the variance by 1 over k squared. And that means when we have our mean estimator, it will have a reduced variance compared to the original distribution a, and the variance will have reduced by 1 over k. And the standard deviation will have reduced by 1 over the square root of k. That means if I double the number of samples, then I double the precision of my uh, estimator in terms of the variance of the estimator. And now similarly, if we were, uh, were thinking about distributing our money among stock, so we have different companies that we can invest in, if these stocks were independent from one another, and if they were described by the same underlying probability distribution, that then we should then we should just evenly uniformly distribute the, our available money across all these investments and have the same expected return then for the individual investment but the variance of our portfolio will have increased decreased by 1 over k compared to the single investment opportunity okay. however these assumptions do not hold. 
So we do not have independence between the different stocks. And uh, before we go into the reasons for that, let's uh, talk about another term that often comes up, which is correlation. So correlation is pretty close to covariance. However, correlation is normalized so that it is easier to think about correlation. Um, um, so let me give you an example. Uh, the, the definition for the correlation here is the covariance divided by the standard deviation of the first times the standard deviation of the second random variable. And uh, this normalization means that the correlation of a random variable with itself will always be exactly one. Uh, because then we have exactly here the, the variance of A divided by the variance of A. For uh, different random variables, if they are independent, then the correlation will be exactly zero. That means they are independent from one another. If, however, there is a positive correlation, that means the two random variables are like moving together. So if one of them increases, then um, the other one has tendency to have also increased and vice versa for decreasing. The correlation can also be negative, and that means they are moving in opposite directions. So then they are negatively correlated. And uh, we can compute the correlation matrix between all our companies, between their stocks, from historical data. And we come up with a, with a matrix that you see here on the right hand side. On the diagonal, it's all ones, because this is the correlation of the, of the company stock uh, with itself. And then we see some of these uh, stocks with a very high correlation and others even with a negative correlation. So here in the, in the legend you see sometimes the stocks are negatively correlated and oftentimes there is good explanation why this is the case. So this is just the historical observation for the correlation and uh, then we can come up with some reasons, but oftentimes there are many reasons and also contradictory reasons why maybe two stocks are correlated positively or negatively. But let me just give you examples that are more like anecdotes why something like this can happen. So the first example is for positive correlation. And there we have a car manufacturer that is earning less money when he has to pay more for the steel. But when the price for the steel goes up, all of the car manufacturers are earning less money. And that means that in, for the car industry, this is one reason why stocks are possibly positively correlated, because the impact for the price increase for the steel will be an impact in the same direction for all of them. And this is one possible reason for, for the positive correlation of uh, the, the stock prices of car manufacturers. Now to continue with the example, probably the car manufacturer and the steel um, manufacturer, so the, the supply of the steel uh, and the car manufacturer, they are negatively correlated. Meaning if the steel price goes up, then the steel supplier is earning more money and the car manufacturers are earning less money. So these two industries are likely then to be moving contrary to each other and to be negatively correlated. And uh, we can compute the, the correlation or, I mean, and the covariance um, between all the stocks and then exploit this information. So if we then have the information about the covariance, the big question is how can we integrate that in our decision making in order to buy a certain stock or not. And the idea is here to uh, take out some of the risk of our investment by counterbalancing with a negatively correlated stock. And the best thing that can happen to us is to find two stocks that have both high expected reward but have uh, also a high negative correlation. Because that means in expectance both are going up, but for the risk, 
so for the variants, they are cancelling out each other because they are counteracting probably on, on the movements of, of the other one. Okay, but let's, let's uh, see a couple more definitions first, how we can compute with random variables that are not independent. But now we have dependent random variables. And here again we have the laws for adding them and for multiplication with a scalar or for, for scaling them. Uh, first of all the addition. Again the, the mean is easy. For the mean the formula will not change. However the, the variance is now computed differently because if we get this additional red term um, so the, the variance of a plus b is the variance of a plus the variance of b plus two times the covariance of a and b. And this is actually uh, the red part is the covariance a b plus the covariance of b a and because of symmetry this is two times the covariance. And the proof is analog to the proof for addition that we just saw on the slide before. Just we cannot make any longer the assumption that the covariance will be zero. Okay. And now for the scaling. So let alpha and beta be scaling factors and uh, we then have alpha a and beta b. Uh, and uh, the question is what is the covariance between alpha a and beta b? And uh, the, the covariance between the two is alpha times beta covariance rb. Uh, the proof again is one line, so here we have the covariance of uh, alpha a and beta b and we can just pull out alpha beta in front. It's a, it's a one line proof. But usually we not only have two stocks that we're investing in, but we have many stocks that we can potentially invest in. And now we are building up a portfolio w, or this will be a vector usually fat notation, but if I'm writing it by hand, I'm here saying, uh, writing an arrow to indicate that the portfolio W will be a vector. And uh, the, this vector W will contain a scaling factor for every stock. And then we put zero for a stock that we don't buy at all. And we put one for a stock where we put all our money into this one stock, or we put something in between. So the, the portfolio will basically then be described by a vector where the entries are positive and have to sum to one. So here for this, the entries, each of the entry has to be positive and the sum, uh, so the sum of i equals one to n of the wi, this has to be one. And this will be our, uh, our portfolio. Uh, and there we are combining many investments and we are interested in the mean and in the variance of the whole portfolio. Okay, so um, we want uh, first of all describe the joint distribution of all the stocks and the joint distribution of all the stocks is described by a vector mu with all the mean values and with a big covariance matrix big sigma. And for that, we have uh, given uh, like um, um, an index and an ordering to all the random variables. And now all the stocks are one of the random variables here. And we ordered them from, from 1 to n. Okay. And uh, now we take the weighted sum. Uh, so where we take every stock and we weigh it by the... the, the how strongly we have invested in that stock and take the weighted sum and this is then our portfolio and the value of our investment how that will change over time and for this we want to compute the average and the variance the average it's quite easy it's just w transpose times mu and for the variance it is w transposed big sigma w and how this works out um, you can see that by assuming that we only have two different stocks uh, because then we will here have uh, our big sigma equal to the matrix with variance of A, variance of B, 
Oh, why doesn't it work? B. And then the covariance of BA and the covariance of AB. And um, you can just uh, evaluate here then the equation for the overall variance and you will find exactly the equations from the left hand side of this slide and this then also scales up to, to higher dimensions. Okay, So we know the covariance of the stock prices so we can also compute the variance of our portfolio and the mean value of our portfolio and so on. And uh, now the question is how can we decide which is the best portfolio for us. And uh, this is then exactly the Markowitz portfolio selection, so what Markowitz published in 1952. And uh, here we see three different options, but these three options are all in a sense equivalent. The first version is to minimize the variance under earning constraints. That means you go to the bank and you say, um, I want to earn at least 4% every year. And uh, subject to this constraint that you want to earn at least 4% in expectation, you want to minimize the risk. And um, so again, we have here the conditions for our portfolio. So it has to sum to one and all the entries have to be larger than zero. And uh, we are uh, giving a constraint that our earnings have to be at least, our expected value has to be larger than some minimum. It doesn't mean that such a portfolio exists, but your solver will then tell you if there is no feasible solution, for example. But if such a solution exists, then you can uh, further minimize over the variance of that portfolio. And um, if the big sigma is a positive de definite matrix, then we know that this will be a convex optimization problem that we know how to solve with the algorithms from the previous lectures. Another way to express your portfolio preference is to say you want to maximize your earnings, but you also want to limit the risk or you want to limit the variance of your portfolio. Yeah, so you go to the bank, you say, I'm accepting a variance of 0.1 and under that constraint, maximize the expected reward. This will be the formula. Bam, off you go. And we can also integrate the two considerations and say there is an explicit trade-off where uh, we have here, we, where we are maximizing the expected value of the portfolio minus the variance times some scaling factor. And again, we have the the constraints that we have to be somehow, we have to have a sane portfolio. Okay, and um, so you have to somehow indicate your preference or you have to indicate your risk aversion by uh, giving a parameter mu min or variance max or uh, the scaling factor q and uh, the Markowitz portfolio selection will give you the best portfolio there is under the assumptions of modern portfolio theory. So some of the limiting assumptions that we've been discussing before. And uh, professional trading firms are still doing that today. However, they have special ways of uh, improving the covariance matrix. So they obviously, they look at past performance and uh, at uh, covariance and correlation between companies, but they are also integrating already additional knowledge that they have so they have an advantage because they are professionals in the field who have maybe Bloomberg terminals and advanced um, um, analysis tools and uh, they can already then improve the covariance matrix to not only look in the past but also to integrate some of what the changes to the covariances they expect for the future. Um, but just looking at the historical data and how we would have performed on the historical data let's see what were the possible portfolios. Now, the blue dots are exactly the blue dots that were shown earlier. These are the different stocks with their risk and their reward. And now if we combine these stocks into a portfolio by abusing and exploiting the covariances, we can get much better combinations that are more to the upper left. Uh, so high reward with less risk. And um, 
uh, all these these uh, green pluses here, these are portfolios on the efficient frontier and uh, you get them by varying either this Q or varying the mu min um, or the, the variance max parameter. And by using either of the previous three methods, you will end up at a portfolio on this efficient frontier. And in that sense, the three methods are also equivalent. So, uh, because depending on how you uh, choose your preference parameter, you will end up somewhere on the efficient frontier, but you can um, always find the parameters that correspond to each other that result in the same uh, position on the efficient frontier, independently of which of the three methods you're, you're applying underneath. And uh, so if we are reducing risk uh, to the minimum, we will end up with government bonds because only they have zero risk. So here there is, there is one portfolio here that contains only government bonds. But then when we go up, um, uh, there will be a, a mixture that is exploiting the covariance um, up until the point where we end up at the, the uh, expected reward where only a single a stock can still fulfill that and here again we will have a portfolio that is not a mixture but that contains only one stock. Okay, but here we have selected some Q and uh, this has given us a portfolio on the efficient frontier for the historical data for the hundred random stocks that uh, we consider. Uh, you see here how the distribution was done in, in that portfolio and uh, we see in the historical data how that would have performed and uh, it's actually a quite um, uh, impressive curve uh, because many of the natural random movements have somehow been filtered out and uh, the stock is increasing but it looks as if it is reduced by risk by, by quite a bit. Of course, this can only consider historical data and everything that is not contained in the historical data um, is not foreseen by this method. So if you have historical data without, without a financial crisis, your model would not predict a financial crisis and uh, you can be very much off from your original prediction. So be careful, just by knowing Markowitz and the modern portfolio theory does not make you a professional investor, uh, but at least you can sensibly speak to uh, some bank advisor and uh, probably you will know more about modern portfolio theory now than, than they do. However, the, the real professionals who work at the stock market and the quants uh, that are employed by uh, the, the big trading firms, they, they have much more advanced models than this now. So in the last 70 years this was improved. So we no longer assume only Gaussian distributions or only mean and covariance, but also uh, higher order modes of the distributions. Uh, we can have negative investments, so short positions on some of the stocks. We can consider multi-period trading strategies and also consider maybe the, the price uh, if you are switching stocks because there also there's a transaction cost to consider and so on. So today the models are much more advanced, but this will be a quite good baseline and give you some idea um, why investing at the stock market is not necessarily as risky as one thinks if you find a good balance and if you're confident that, for example, there will be no financial crisis in the next year.